Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Historia Politica Publica. This is the second part of the series about Judith Sklar and some of her texts. In the first episode I was analyzing the liberalism of fear and in this episode I will give some conclusion about uh, this war that was published in 1999. And also we talk about two other essays which are called Misfortune and Injustice and the other is called A Conscience and Liberty. So just to do a quick sum up of the liberalism of fear, this is a concept that she uh, explains as the modern warfare state in which uh, through a systemic means of coercion, the state creates a state of fear among the population in order to avoid the uh, worst crimes. So for instance, she points how we cannot just let people to proceed in society focusing on their morality because this can uh, have negative consequences such as, for example, imagine that a person hates homosexuals and this person thinks that they do not deserve to exist according to their morality. So in that sense, for instance, the liberalism of fear uh, must make that person to not commit a crime against them. Liberalism of fear as a kind of mechanism to punish the person who do something evil. And also liberalism of fear in its most negative connotation as a kind of state in which people must be fearful to do something else. So obviously in his, let's say, my most positive uh, aspect will be to avoid uh, punish, uh, avoid crimes of different people, but in its most uh, perversive uh, approach will be to eliminate the sense. In that sense, a Judas Clark is very clear when she says that what is to be feared is everything extra legal, secret, and unauthorized, and act by public agents on their deputies. End quote. So how to avoid that? Uh, obviously, she's referring to the kind of espionage among citizens that the CIA has been a doing uh, among its uh, population. I mean, obviously, she wrote that 30 years before the scandal of WikiLeaks. So no, sorry, 20 something years before. Nevertheless, she points about how when the states break legality, that is when it is uh, it becomes a, a big problem. Also, we can think about the Watergate scandal or in different countries, espionage in Spain or in Latin America, the lawfare process to overthrow democratically elected governments and so on. In order to avoid that crime, Judas Clark says, quote, we need to join through voluntary associations to become significant units of social power and influence that can check or at least alter the assertion of other organized agents, end quote. We can think about uh, climate activists to avoid the uh, that the big companies uh, pollute the planet in a free way. In the United Kingdom, as I mentioned in the last episode, there was a huge protest carried by Extinction Rebellion, the ecological activists, in which they demand the UK government to take measures against these huge companies that are uh, gradually destroying the planet. And Eventually, the UK government agreed to uh, set a, a goal that for 2050, they will reach the net zero emissions target. So this movement outside of the, let's say, institutional sphere or political sphere in the way that politics uh, is referred by Judith Sklar, which is just the things that are being done in parliament, so those uh, groups are fundamental in order to push society toward progress. In that sense, which is the task of a liberal, liberal citizen? According to Judith Sklar, it's his quote, to see that not one official or unofficial agent can intimidate anyone, except through the use of well understood and accepted legal procedures, end quote. Henceforth, police cannot repress a uh, peaceful demonstration, uh, and this is something that is being done in every country. There are measures that are being more authoritarian in the United States. The, uh, the, penal the penalization of the abortion in the United Kingdom against refugees or the recent measures to use violence to repress the manifestations. 
At the same time, uh, you Clark believed that this kind of violence or use of state force must be used only when there is a real threat, such as a menace that somebody is going to kill people on or so on. So coercion should be limited and just to repress the threat of cyber cruelty. Obviously, a pacific demonstration uh, to support the climate, the right of minorities, Black Lives Matter, feminism, those are not acts of cyber cruelty. But eventually, because the state has the power and they are aligned with the most richest companies, which uh, in the case of the climate, the environmental activists will be uh, will lose uh, wealth if they want to reduce their emissions. The the alliance between capitalists and state can a uh, force their way that they prefer to approach the society. And therefore, this is very complicated matter, but the groups that are jo joining in the public sphere, or as Judith Sklar called them, these voluntary association to become significant units are fundamental for the well-being of the whole society. At the same time, Judith Sklar, uh, as I mentioned in the first episode, doesn't believe that liberalism must be a philosophy. In other words, shall not offer an ethical guidance, because any person uh, in a liberal society should be free to pursue their interests, as long as this doesn't undermine the freedom of others. This is one of the main ideas of liberalism as implemented by people like John Locke or John Stuart Mill. In that sense, Judith Sklar believed that, quote, liberalism must restrict itself just to politics, end quote. So the idea is to create the perfect condition in society to let people pursue their own interests. And for that, they need to receive free education, free health care, the possibility to engage in the public sphere in a healthy environment, such as uh, in the modern school implemented by uh, Francisco Ferrer. Ferrer y Guardia, the Catalan uh, thinker of the 20th century, 19th century, 20th century, who created an innovative system to let the children enjoy the nature, engage with others, and not just following a kind of uh, huge reading stuff, but also to let them wonder about their life and think freely. Different things, obviously. Francisco Ferrer Guardia was assassinated by the Spanish regime because he, he was accused face, false, falsely to instigate a revolution and so on. So education, the free education, it is a something fundamental in uh, a liberal or libertarian society and in that way liberalism and anarchism coincide perfectly. So again, liberalism of fear, uh, it is to avoid people killing for moral or spiritual causes. Uh, obviously, this will not be necessary in a highly educated society in which people are aware and have empathy about the others. Or as Judith Sklar pointed, quote, if we learn to accept each other as sentient beings, end quote. Um, in that sense, uh, for her, the opposite of a kind of liberal government, uh, it is that government that uh, was proclaiming Viva la Muerte. And this is something that she points in her essay, Liberalism of Fear, a clear reference to uh, the Spanish Francoists uh, who were proclaiming that cry with Millana Stripe, the Phalangist, and so. So, a, the experience of politics uh, indirectly must educate the citizens, such as uh, respect for the claim of others, self-restraint, and so on. Uh, henceforth, for Judith Sklar, liberalism must not have as a main aim to educate the citizens, but indirectly they will do like, for example, if we believe that every person has the right to vote, the right to express themselves, uh, Inevitably, we will uh, respect the other people. But what happens when the people do not respect the results of the elections or the freedom of others? Well, we have coup d'etats uh, we had in Spain, in Portugal, in Latin America, but recently we have the assault in the Capitolio two years ago. We have the recent uh, assault in Brazil because uh, in those two movements, the people 
refused the defeats of Trump on, on Bolsonaro, respectively. In that sense, the citizens must put their efforts to create a society of well-informed and self-direct uh, adults, and this must be the aim of a liberal society, to educate the citizens. This is said by Sklar, but also by Kropotkin, Emma Goldman, Bakunin, Francisco Ferreri Guardia, Daniel Gary, Noam Chomsky, Kant, uh, Rousseau. So here we see the coincidence between uh, the think of the, the thought story of the Enlightenment, the liberal and the libertarian, the anarchist, and so on. And this is something that Chomsky remarks uh, in his books, how the ideas of von Humboldt or of Rousseau and Immanuel Kant uh, have found their earth in anarchism nowadays. One of the most controversial topics that Sklar touches in, he, in her essay is that this idea about imposing liberalism in other societies. Uh, it is always told that uh, from the Western point of view, it is not right to try to analyze societies in other countries which maybe are more conservative or have different uh, system of government. But he, she is very skeptical about that. Uh, for her, uh, it would be great to ask those people if they are really enjoying their chains in which they are uh, being prisoned. Uh, she points the example of Mao Zedong in China. She asserts that people in China were not happy at the time, but they did not have another uh, option, but obviously if they were given uh, the option to create a new government, they definitely would have changed that. Uh, this is the idea of Sklar, uh, so proposing an alternative to that side. The problem of Sklar here is that even though this approach it may be uh, supported and it, it has sense in many reasons, it is that uh, she speaks about the United States uh, and how in the past it was not a liberal society because the black people were oppressed. Uh, but here she speaks about the past, uh, referring to the time of the, the war, the civil war in America. And then on she analyzed how US become liberal. But at the same time, uh, while supporting her approach to other countries in which obviously there is an undermining of rights, uh, at the same time she cannot or she should not consider US as liberal in the way that she proclaims like social liberal because the black people and other minorities are still being systematically oppressed, not as explicitly as before, but looking at the statistics of the prisons and so on, it is obvious that the, and the place where they live, the black people, have less rights than the white. And therefore here I will disagree with her idea of the US liberal society. And even if we think in uh, like the United Kingdom, how the refugees or the immigrants have less rights than the British people and so on, uh, it is interesting how following uh, her approach that in the past US was not liberal because there were a, a group of people who did not have the same rights as others, do we have in any society nowadays uh, a total equality between the citizens? If the answer is no, then it is hardly uh, assumable that we can define those societies as liberals in Judas class there. So finishing with this uh, incredible essay full of ideas, liberalism of fear, I wanted to talk a bit about misfortune and injustice, uh, injustice sorry, which is she makes a kind of a historical review about the origin of the Enlightenment thought. And also the concept of misfortune and injustice she defines as misfortune is something that happened out of nowhere and that we cannot really uh, have a solution about that is just bad luck. So she points the example of the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, whereas injustice is this idea that there are, there are terrible things happening in the world which they have a, solu a solution and if they are happening, it is our fault. See points, for example, um, when there is famine in Africa, this is happening because these people do not have resources which our, ourselves in the Western world we have and we are not sharing with them. So if there are the infant mortality is higher in those areas, if the amount of disease is more spreadable than here in Europe, this is precisely uh, an, 
injustice because uh, the wealth is not being is not being redistributed accordingly to the needs of each other. We can think about the NHS in the United Kingdom, how in the last 10, 20 years has been undermined by the cuts in, in, the, in that public sector. And precisely people are being dying for neglection. And there was a recent uh, comment in the New Statesman about the statistics, how many people had been dying just because there were not enough resources and uh, for kind of illness uh, or malaises that could have had been cured like some decades ago. So this is injustice for Judith Sklar. The idea that we can avoid uh, pain in people, but this is not being done for lack of resources, uh, lack of redistribution of resources because the resources are there, but just in fewer hands than before. So going back to an example of misfortune, which is the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, which was uh, a disaster for the city because also uh, create a, a tsunami also in the city. Also, there was fire. So you had water, earth and fire all going on and destroying. I, I think it destroyed almost half of the, the capital. It was something uh, absolutely incredible. According to Judith Sklar, this was the last cry against divine, divine injustice. Uh, it was seen as the start of the line and thought because for Judith Sklar, people at that time in Europe realized that God perhaps did not exist or either we could not just follow him because this earthquake was uh, deadly. And then at the, the same time, we had philosophers, like Rousseau, Voltaire, uh, there was also a uh, Immanuel Kant, and so, so it, after in the second half of the 18th century, you have a huge movement of thinkers which coincide with this natural disaster in Lisbon, and all of these coalesce uh, in the current of the alignment. Voltaire famously said a phrase which was something like, "If God did not exist, we would have to invent him." What he wanted to say is that a, the uh, figure of God, it was fundamental for people to have faith in life because otherwise uh, many, many people in society will fell into despair thinking that there was nothing else beyond the material earth. And uh, Karl Marx one century later says something similar when he exposed that uh, religion is the opium of the people in the way that uh, because there were people living under a, a situation of huge poverty, uh, carrying on in miserable life, uh, they needed a kind of uh, drug to not fall into despair. And this uh, opium precisely was the religion. He was not criticizing religion at all, but most of all the systemic situation uh, living in society in which people were forced to believe in something that they could not even demonstrate, but otherwise, if their life were just working 14 hours per day, or living under miserable conditions in their house, seeing their children die, and so on, uh, one of their only uh, doors to f look for another reality was precisely religion. In that sense, a Speaking about now injustice, a, this idea of uh, that expressed by Voltaire that our sense of injustice is our best protection against oppression. So morally, when we consider something is injustice, it's helpful to organize in movement in order to a kind of uh, overthrow this systematic exploitation that we are being forced upon it upon us. At the same time, he points that blaming oneself thought in just has its satisfaction because it can sustain belief in a, a just world and give one a sense of at least some power in determining one situation. 
This is, for example, uh, Margaret Thatcher famously blaming the poor people for being poor. Like, it is their fault uh, because they are not uh, working enough. They are they don't have this mentality, the winning mentality. And Donald Trump did something similar recently. Like, okay, this is a society of winners and losers. Do you want to be a winner? So just, you know, invent things, approach life with a different way, uh, change your mind, you, the happiness is on your head. This is also one of the ideas of mindfulness that doesn't matter the rest of the world, just is, if you are not happy, it's just your fault and so on. So this is blaming yourself, uh, blame, blaming oneself uh, has its own satisfaction and Voltaire said almost three centuries ago. In that sense, uh, also Sklar points the idea of political necessity, how since Machiavelli, necessity has served to paper over the tension between ethical restraint and political ambition in an effort to exploit the language of doom for the sculptation of ruler. This idea of the collateral damage when a country invaded another region and there are people who are killed, this is called sometimes collateral damage. This was highly used by George Bush after the invasion of Afghanistan. Okay, what happened when civilians of that country are being murdered by the US force? And he said that this was part of a, 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 a huge, uh, a most important goal, which was to defeat terrorism. So uh, those that were being killed, even though they were innocent, those were as called by Bush collateral damage. In that sense, a for Kant, for example, uh, the award is both misfortune and unjust because it's something that uh, the people who are living in a country uh, who have not had vote for decide what is happening are being killed uh, and at the same time it's unjust because it, ca it could be a stop uh, with other help. So this is uh, very important in that sense and uh, I will uh, finish next episode talking about this idea of misfortune and injustice and conscience and liberty.